Monaco, which is concerning extended foster care services. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Alison Mendiola, committee staff, before you is Senate Bill 5230, sponsored by the Chair, um, Chair Wilson. This bill has to do with creating the post-extended foster care program in the Department of Children, Youth, and Families and making changes to the extended foster care program. Currently, if a youth is in foster care on their 18th birthday, they can be eligible for extended foster care by voluntarily agreeing to receive foster care services which are available until they turn 21, provided they meet the following criteria as established by state and federal law that they are enrolled in high school or the equivalent, that they are enrolled or intend to enroll in post-secondary education, including vocational training, participating in a program to promote or remove barriers to employment, they are employed 80 plus hours per month, or they're unable to engage in any of these activities due to a documented medical condition. Under this bill, a number of changes are made to the extended foster care program, including su setting a subsidy rate in statute. DCOAF cannot create additional eligibility requirements beyond what is set in statute, and the youth does not need to be involved in one of the activities mentioned above, which means that particular youth's participation in extended foster care would be state funded. This bill also creates a post-extended foster care program for youth ages 21 through 25. They must have been dependent on their 18th birthday, and um, those who were in extended foster care are automatically enrolled. The subsidy rate for this is also set in statute. DCYF is to contract out for services for post-extended foster care and consult with the stakeholder group. The members are listed in your bill report and a fiscal note was requested and not yet received. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Allison. Thank you. I had the opportunity to do a um, Child Welfare Fellows Project with the National Council of State Legislators and so a lot of the work that I've done over the last um, numbers of months has been really looking at our child welfare system and thinking about what we're doing federally, how we're really waiving um, as many of the things as we can from the federal level so that we're able to use our state dollars more flexibly, which is what happens. And so um, foster care is one of those systems where we have state raised kids. And we hear a lot from our um, young people that uh, we've not necessarily done them justice and we are putting them in pathways um, of not successful, um, successfully be able to have hopes and dreams like all of us want our young people to have. Um, so this bill um, is really around children and young adults that are phasing out of our foster care system and their express need that they've said they need to have more support to help put them on pathways of success. And it is our responsibility as a state to care for these children that are in the foster system. Um, and it also is um, something incredibly important as we help young people create the pathway to independence. And independence means that uh, there's different levels of support needed, but you also need to be independent while you're doing that. And that's the job of an adolescent. That's a job of a young adult. Um, and we've seen, we've seen success in our current extended foster care program. And what we know and what we've heard and what we see is those young people that are participate are, likely, are more likely to be employed and more likely to make greater earnings. Um, the 2020 study of the extended foster care program also showed that it significantly reduces homelessness. It reduces the chances of being on public assistance reduces the diagnosis of substance abuse and the need for treatment. It reduces the um, criminal convictions and um, involvement in the system. And it also decreases the involvement of a young person's own children in a welfare system as they become parents themselves. What we also know is that nearly 20% of our young people in the foster system do not um, participate in this program. And so one of the first things we need to do is make sure we identify and we find them and that they know this program exists. So 5230 creates a post-extended foster care program in the Department of Children, Youth, and Families, and it would continue to support our youth and young adults ages 21 through 25, who were, as um, Allison said, in out-of-home care on their 18th birthday. 
It would also provide financial subsidy, housing navigation, and connections to housing programs because money is not enough. We know in this community, we know in our state, we know right now in this world we need to support all of our individuals and housing as a service and one of the most important things. The bill also um, allows for a young person to change their mind. Sometimes young people make a choice to exit a system and then whoops, they decide maybe they made the wrong choice and they really do need to have the support. In our systems before was once you're out, you're out. And this system allows a young person to change their mind and to um, perhaps save face and be able to say, you know what, I'm coming back in because that support really mattered and really meant a lot to me. And that's okay. It directs uh, DCYF to make a number of changes to the program. And again, um, the one that is keeping um, keeping us from doing this is the federal regulation. And so what we want to do is change the eligibility requirement so that the youth no longer have to meet that federal eligibility requirement in order to access um, extended foster care using our state dollars. We need to do everything we can to continue to reduce barriers um, in our systems that were never created to help people out of them. Um, in so many ways were, help, were created to keep people right where they were. And this is one of those other systems, just like we've done with parent pay, just like we've done with Department of Corrections assessments and payments um, that we're making corrections and individuals that are incarcerated pay for. Um, these are things that in order to help young people create generational wealth and success in their adult life that we need to do as a state. And with that, I am ha happy to answer any questions and look forward to the testimony. But I also see Senator Saldana just walk in. So what I'm going to do is ask Allison to brief that bill so Senator Saldana can um, give her testimony and then we'll go back to um, hear testimony on the other bill. Thanks. Madam Chair, members of the committee, before you is Senate Bill 5256. Here, first panel. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have some remote testimony from Jim Theophilus. Minnie Leisner, Joshua Wood Walker, and Linda Hall. Jim, I see you first. So we got the timer on 90 seconds and good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jim Theophilus and I'm the proud founder and executive director of North Star Advocates and the founding executive director of the Mockingbird Society, where in 2006, young people brought forth the concept of extended foster care. It received bipartisan support here and became a federal program. I'm here today asking you to pass 5230 out of committee. Extended foster care is a research proven program that ensures that young people exiting foster care have safe housing while they go to school, get a job, and address their behavioral health needs. There's been research in Washington and other states on extended foster care. And as Madam Chair said, young people who participate are more likely to delay early parenting than their peers, more likely to not have a diagnosis of substance use disorder, not to become homeless, not to be a recipient of public assistance or to engage in criminal behavior. They are more likely to be employed, at, get some college and, and trade school. Washington Institute of Public Policy most recent evaluation identified $3.95 benefit for every dollar invested. In fact, the only criticism I've heard is that it stops at age 21. We know from brain science and our own life experience, 21 is too early to be self-sufficient, especially those who have experienced multiple change in homes, schools, and relationships. It is now time, Madam Chair, to take our lessons learned and expand this proven cost-effective program. And sometimes, like with our own children, we don't have every detail figured out but we always protect them with urgency, commitment, and vision. Please pass Senate Bill 5230. Thank you very much. Right on the money. Appreciate that. Um, next up, I see, who's that? Joshua. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, and thank you for allowing me this time to speak to you all today. 
My name is Joshua Woodwalker, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Washington in the Master's of Social Work program. Additionally, I've spent the last six years of my professional career as a social worker working directly for child welfare. I have seen the impact that the extended foster care program has on our most vulnerable youth here in Washington State. It provides an opportunity for youth coming out of care to have support in early adulthood and provides a safety net for these youth so that they are not subjected to homelessness and that they and so they can obtain a safe and stable living environment while either working or going to school. I have seen many young adults in the extended foster care program who are eager learners and hardworking individuals that deserve the support as they come out of foster care. During the height of the pandemic, with, when jo Governor Jay Inslee allowed for the youth for youth to temporarily temporarily stay in the extended foster care program after 21 years old, I saw the impacts that ki that kept young adults in stable living environments as they were on the verge of lo losing much of everything they have built up over time. I have seen the impact that this program has, which breaks the generational cycle of families coming back into care, and I've seen how our most vulnerable youth can be resilient and overcome some of the most difficult obstacles in early adulthood with the support of the extended foster care program. I appreciate the time given to me to speak on this matter today and urge lawmakers to work on passing this critical bill that would provide critical, su crucial support for some of the most vulnerable and at youth risk uh, at risk youth in our state. I welcome any lawmaker to discuss this matter further and provide insight on this matter from someone who works directly with this population. Thank you. Thank you so much and thanks for your timeliness. Next up, we have um, Linda. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. For the record, my name is Linda Hall for Treehouse and we are testifying other on Senate Bill 5230. We are in strong support of sections one through six that remove barriers to enrollment in extended foster care. We also support the establishment of an economic step-down program for young people exiting EFC. Treehouse has collected data that demonstrates both the need and the impact of this kind of support. However, this bill may be insufficient to address the real change, the real challenge needed uh, culture change at DCYF around the responsibility and commitment to young people transitioning out of foster care. We believe the needs to be a statement of responsibility to hold the state accountable for providing proactive supports as young people go through adolescent process. We have some specific concerns around Section 7. As noted during our December 2nd work session, this year's extended EFC payments have been more complicated and expensive than ex anticipated. The infrastructure, the infrastructure is not sustainable and was never intended to exist long term. We urge the state to fully fund the infrastructure with a fiscal note that includes adequate staffing, additional supports, and a 10% indirect rate. We also encourage exploration of whether attachment to DCYF post age 21 is ideal, and if the young people might be better served through economic services or categorical eligibility for universal basic income. Additionally, we wonder <laughs> and if an additional planning process is needed given the ongoing planning for efforts of EFC and independent living that have not culminated. We urge you to adequately structure, fund, and design an economic step-down plan for young people for whom the state has special responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Minnie. Hello, and thank you, Chair Wilson and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Minnie Bleesner. I am the Managing Director of the Co-Design Institute through SDMC. Our mission is to preach the value of putting those with lived experience at the center of the program and policy design process and uplifting the voices of those who are traditionally outside of that process. Our firm, SDMC, has been running the extended foster care system assessment in partnership with Partners for Our Children. We have recruited over 40 young people with lived experience from across the state to engage in the assessment of EFC through our co-design work. We're in support of the expanded EFC care bill. Co-design is meant to center the voices of lived experience, and exactly that's exactly what this bill is. Um, extensive lived exper expert engagement was informed formed in the creation of this bill. While there are always changes needed in, access, in accessing transitional living, the purpose of our work is to bring young adults into reimagining how they interact with the system and making those changes real. 
We are actively working alongside foster youth and young adults to make their EFC experience better. We believe our work in the assessment works in tandem with this bill, and we hope to use it as a grounding for how we address service delivery within DCYF. This bill would enhance our work. The EFC program needs to be evaluated so we do not perpetuate the problems the program currently faces, but it starts with the work like this bill. From what we have seen, we urge a yes vote on this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right on target. <laughs> and our next panel, um, Madam Chair, is Sean Gardner, Emily Stochel, Allison Krutzinger, and Samuel Martin. So how about we um, how about we start? Okay, there we go. Sam, why don't you come up and um, be in the row right behind him? And as soon as somebody moves, you can scoot yourself right up there, and we can set the clock. And Allison, why don't you start? Great. Good after morning, afternoon, morning. It's still morning. It's still morning. <laughs> it's not noon yet. For the record, Allison Kretzinger with the Department of Children, Youth, and Families here signed in as other today, speaking specifically to the parts of this bill that contemplate that 18 to 21 year old population. DCYF shares the goal that people in extended foster care should be met with compassion and support during their transitions. And we recognize that the experience of young people in foster care varies across the state. We also recognize that changes to RCW do not always result in the necessary practice and culture change really needed to do good work at DCYF. Through implementation of other child welfare reforms over the past three years, we've learned that truly creating consistent practice change takes time and thoughtful collaboration with young people with lived experience as well as our staff doing the work. In 2022, the legislature directed DCYF to complete the extended foster care systems assessment to understand the current realities uh, and make recommendations. We are coupling this with a co-design process that is underway to reimagine what extended foster care can look like for youth across the state. For these reasons, we think this bill is premature to that work concluding and we expect recommendations in June of 2023. We're aligned with the intent and the goals outlined in Senate Bill 5230, but ultimately to believe that we can accomplish these post the co-design work being done and the recommendations being understood. Thank you for your time. Thanks. And when did you say the co-design work was going to be completed? June of 2023. So six-ish months. Okay. Now. All right. Thank you. Sean, you want to go? Yes. Um, I should have given you a warning. Sorry, sorry. about that. You're fault. good. Um, uh, first, I'd like to thank the chair and the committee for being available to look at this bill and accept me to testify in favor of it in person. My name is Sean Gardner, and I've been in foster care for almost the last five years, and I've been in the EFC for more than two of those. My experience with foster care is very serious. I take it very seriously. And if you want to know more about what I mean by that, I'd be happy to answer any and all of your questions during or after this testimony. Even though I'm exiting EFC, I'm glad to say that when this bill gets approved, I'll be able to re-enter and experience the same positive impacts that it'll have on the other young adults who will be experiencing EFC themselves in the future. Once it gets approved and put into law, I'll, it'll impact my life by making me feel comfortable that I'll be able to pay bills on time, be able to afford daily necessities, be able to pay for school and work materials, and or I can start saving for my future with the stipend that'll be providing on top of other income I might be getting. While on the other hand, I might, it might not be able to cover all of an adult's rent, it'll create another safety net by at least helping pay part of it and or a whole of it if they're currently in a voucher housing program. This bill will help those that don't have housing by making them be able to use the stipend to pay for a down payment or a full month's rent on a small studio or apartment so that they'll be able to get a job and or go to school during that first month. Now, if I have time, I'd like to emphasize my experience in EFC and my personal story about foster care and my and how more of these future bills will put a positive impact in the lives of other young adults. Is it all right if I ask, ask for 30 more seconds? All right. Um, so uh, I'm here to make sure, um, you know, it's kind of a, uh, I want to put FOSC, uh, D DCYF in their place. You know, they're, they're not being responsible. Um, I'm currently in the works of a bill of my own not for extended foster care, but for just foster care in general from eight to 18. You know, um, when I exited, uh, the only reason why I'm here today is because I committed a crime when I was 16 years old. And that crime is the only thing that kept me from being homeless. When I exited my foster uh, mom's house on January 17th, a little over a year ago, 
the um, state put me in a, a hotel for five months, and uh, that was only because I had a crime in my name. I only have one crime, um, but but yeah, uh, I left with only $160 uh, out of that home, and this bill that I'm working on is going to um, try to uh, at least uh, require foster parents to put $100 in a savings account every month. There's already a, f a financial bill getting, uh, trying to get approved that is requiring from for age of 14 to put $25 in a month. Uh, for. for so we need, to, we need to keep talking and we need to keep working, okay? So yeah. um, I appreciate you coming in front of committee today and it's incredibly nice to meet you. Lived experience and life experience is what drives and what should be driving legislation and so your input is critically important. Um, so we'd love to talk future on that one. And right now, what I'm hearing you say is you're in support of the bill that you just testified yes. in front of related to extended foster care. Yeah? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Let's keep in touch, okay? All right. Awesome. Next up, Emily, go for it. Hello, Chair Wilson and honorable members of the committee. For the record, my name is Emily Stochel, and I'm the Program Manager of Government Relations and Advocacy at the College Success Foundation. I'm testifying also as someone who has uh, lived experience in foster care. I urge you to support this bill because I believe it tackles equity issues that make it disproportionately difficult for adults who have experienced foster care to survive and thrive. Over the last couple years, there's been a lot of co-design work with people with lived experience and care, like you've heard about, and we have consistently identified expanding the accessibility of EFC as one of the solutions that can help us get the support we need to ultimately be completely self-sufficient. I've worked in the field for over 10 years now, and I continue to see people that have exited care end up in situations in early adulthood um, where they have nowhere to go and very little support. Personally, I have had I not secured a job within two days of graduating college when I was 21, I would have been homeless again and it would have changed my entire trajectory. People like me don't have a safety net to fall back on when we run out of resources. The state is responsible for children in foster care and our needs automatically don't automatically disappear when we turn a certain age. Senate Bill 5230 would make a huge difference because it would support people through situations like this and give young adults more capacity to thrive instead of just survive. Thank you so much for your time. All right, Sam. Awesome. Thank you, Chair Wilson and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Sam Martin, and I'm the lobbyist with the Mockingbird Society. We're an advocacy organization with the goal of uplifting the voices of lived experts with the hopes of supporting young people who have experience with homelessness as well. I'm coming to you today in support of this bill as well. As Jim Theophilus spoke about earlier in 2006, we ran the first version of this bill, and that was the first opportunity that I got to testify in front of this great Senate. I am truly in support of this bill and truly in support of this work. We know that this would remove barriers, increase supports, and extend support to vulnerable youth. The supports for ages 18 and 21, no, we know that young people need more support with housing, with job, with employment, and with making sure that they can pursue their education. We've heard earlier today too that there are potential challenges with um, being able to ensure that our um, Section 7 uh, serving ages 21 to 25, there may be challenges, but we know and have talked with um, you know, a variety of community organizations like the Scholar Fund who would be willing to be able to help stand up this work and continue this work. We know that the infrastructure is out there and that folks are very dedicated and, and committed to making sure that young people can receive these resources in a way that's timely and appropriate. Again, just as I did in 2006, I'm happy to stand here today and say that we're in extreme support of this bill and we'll look forward to continuing to have your support from the Senate and moving this work forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. With that, we will close the hearing on um, Senate Bill 5230 concerning